your foot really bad. You do? Yeah, I just got the urge. Huh. Violence. Not the answer. Not always the answer, ladies and gentlemen. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. About to roll. Roll us. Roll us. Welcome to... Roll out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Emotion Chips, where we talk about the real reason. Everything happens for a reason. I am your host, Charlie Carroll, along with my chic co-host, <laughs> okay. Mallory Redmond. Sporting the lemons. Yes. Hey, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. When life gives you lemons... Go ahead and finish it. Put it on it. Put them on a shirt. Put them on a shirt. That's not what I had, but that's okay. Oh. I thought we were going to make lemonade. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really big into lemonade. A lot of sugar. But I like weird shirts. Yeah. A lot of sugar and lemonade. That's true. Yes. Um, Welcome to the program. How are you feeling? Ready to go? I'm so ready to go. I need to get my second wind. Took us a little bit to get going, so I started getting tired. Yes. I woke up at three in the morning Realize, does this happen to you? Well, probably not because you're not as... I am very serious about paying my bills on time. Ouch. I'm very serious about paying my bills you're, on time. I just have a lot more. Uh, you, go I on, just go feel on. like you You are of the mindset of like, well, if they really want to get paid, they'll come back to me. It just depends. Go on. Anyways, I realized in three in the morning that my car payment was due a few days ago and I didn't pay it. And so that's the worst feeling to me because I want to get up and pay it. Yeah. But because of, I don't know, it's a very long story, but I can't pay it online. I have to call it in like it's 1960. So I couldn't do anything about it, which is a terrible feeling. I'm like, do you think anybody is up at the Chevy payment center in Texas right now at 3 a.m.? Yeah. Probably not in Texas though. No. So I just had to make a note and let that be good enough. That, that happened to me this week with American Express that my, I remembered they, they send you a reminder. Yeah, I don't even get that. Literally, I get a paper bill in the... This is like, it's so retro. A wow. paper bill in the mail, and then that's all. I, and then I have to call it in on a landline, too. They won't even let me call in on a cell phone. What? <laughs> what are, uh, I was going to say, what are you talking about? What's, what's happening? <laughs> that part I'm exaggerating. But anyway, okay. go ahead. American Express. Well... They'll send you a reminder that uh, your payment is due, but they don't do it till you're one day late. And oh. there, there, there's no late payment. You just don't get the points. Oh. And so because of all of the businesses, it's not uncommon to have a, I don't know, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar $50,000 bill. And if you make it one day late, your payment one day late, you don't get your 50,000 points, which- you should, put, you should put it in your calendar. <laughs> oh, should I? <laughs> oh, should I? Yes, you're right. I mean, that's a great lying. way to do it. No late pay, no late fee, but you lose your points. Yep. That's motivating. Yep, it sure is. Yeah, so anyways, I made a note on my calendar to make the payment today, and then that had to be good enough. But you know, it reminded me that I don't know. Did you have, okay, so I used to, when I would wake, when this would happen to me and I would wake up in the middle of the night, yeah. for whatever reason, I wasn't doing like digital calendars then. I don't know why. Uh, I would Wait, take, you wrote it out? Like you had a calendar that you wrote? Well, yeah, I used to have like a paper calendar, like okay. a planner. Yeah, yeah, oh, a planner, yeah. Anyway, if I if I needed to remember something in the morning, <laughs> I would just like take an object by my bed and throw it in the middle of my floor and go back to bed. And then when I woke up the next morning, I'd be like, why is that there? Oh, yeah, I have to make my car payment. That's really smart. Thanks. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I don't do it anymore. No, but it's good. Yeah. Be like, why is that? Picture frame in the it, middle of my bedroom floor. Yeah, it's it's kind of bringing a three dimensional object to your thought. I yeah. like it. Very good. So there's a little tip for you guys. I'm out. Have a good episode. You've got everything you came for. You don't need to listen to another what thing else do you today. Need? Uh, How are you? More importantly, I'm good. I'm good. Doing well. Uh, I was telling someone the story uh, this morning that uh, after church on Sunday, which we only have one more week, um, right. I walked down to table thirty three and. Uh, there were a number of um, faculty from our children, where our children go to school. Uh-huh. And uh, I was introduced to a woman that I I knew her name, but I had not met her. And like within, I don't know, a couple of minutes, she was like, you want to see my tattoo? Oh. And things escalated quite quickly. Yeah. 
I'm like, good for her. Sure. Yeah. Because I'm thinking about a tattoo. I don't know where what I'm gonna do, but I am thinking about it. And, and and so I said, yeah. And so she stands up, and and I guess she had been walking with a friend, and pulls her shirt up, and on her back, like on her side, like on her ribs. I think that's kind of okay. Like I don't know, maybe the cool, sexy place to do it. Oh, I for don't a woman know. these days. I neither do I. I know it's no longer the lower back. <laughs> I've I've gotten that memo. Uh, are you guys? Are you still gonna have that removed? Stop! I don't have any tattoos. Surprisingly enough. Surprisingly, and so she pulls her shirt up and shows me this tattoo, uh, and I, I asked her if she knew where it came from, and she said yes, Robert Frost. I said, well, Robert Frost. Kind she of. an English teacher? No. Good question, though. Thank you. I I said, well, Robert Frost took that from Marcus Aurelius, who was a a Roman uh, leader. You emperor. schooled your kid's teacher? Well, no. I, I, well, I, I love the quote. The last That's time it. she lifts up her shirt in front of you. Yeah, no more of that. Uh, I, I was very interested in that quote. I, I like it. And so we started talking about it, uh, which got me thinking more about Marcus Aurelius and what I had literally just talked about an hour before that. Uh, do you remember the movie? Wait, have you told us the quote? Oh, sorry. I probably <laughs> probably should. So close to being a good story. I, I probably should do that. Uh, it is what stands in the way becomes the way. Oh, yeah. And, and she had gone through a divorce and sold her house and all of these things. And basically the, the quote was about like not being afraid to move forward in life. Nice. And, and so that that is a Marcus Aurelius quote. What stands in the way becomes the way. And what, Robert Frost took it over? Yeah, took it and made it his own. Sh- shortened it up and made it his own. Uh, but it reminded me of uh, that 19, I think it's 90s, maybe early 2000s, a Gladiator with um, mm-hmm. Russell Crowe. Mm-hmm. And Marcus Aurelius is, is who he is, who Maximus is serving uh, at that point in time. And uh, I, having just talked about the concept of eternity, which we can get into if you would like. Uh, I remember uh, Maximus or Russell Crowe's character saying what we do today, he, they're getting ready for this war against these barbarians and he and he's trying to motivate like his, his soldiers and he says, what we do today echoes or will echo throughout eternity. And like I've always remembered that quote because I think it's so powerful that Whatever we're doing today, like, creates all of these ripples, not not just for ourselves, but for others as, as well. For sure, for better or for worse. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that was that was the idea behind uh, the content for Sunday, as most of you know and have been uh, listening into. Uh, we are transitioning the church that uh, we started 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago into a community center so that it can be, uh, one, a place where people can own their own faith journey, but two, uh, ad fontes, where we're getting back to the source, to the real Jesus movement that was uh, oriented around helping people versus a intellectual exercise or belief system. And so uh, I took on the idea of eternity this past Sunday, and it's so much... uh, um, different than than what we've been told growing up. You were raised in the church. Oh, yeah. Uh, There was a recent poll. I I forget who it was. I think it was Gallup. Uh, 72% of Americans, uh, faith-oriented or not, 72% of Americans believe in heaven. Huh. Well. Very high number. uh, Yeah, but it makes sense. I mean, we all want to, I think it's comforting. Heaven is a comforting thought, especially as, as we... Um, face our own deaths or, or our loved ones are facing sure. death. I think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, did, did you read the article from the AP that I sent you about the death doulas? That's becoming a really popular thing. I don't know if I read the article, but I thought I told you about death doulas. Well, you you, you shared the podcast with yes, me. And then the I, like two days later, there was an article and I, I'm pretty sure it was the AP or Washington Post about Literally, this is the latest thing: death doulas to help uh, people that are that are passing from this world 
into the next and their families Mm -hmm. deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting thing, the way that our culture views and approaches death versus a lot of other cultures, maybe not every other culture, but um, we're so afraid of it. Yeah. And like, I've been there too. I remember when my grandmother died, I flew out East for the funeral and I was the first family member there, like the first out of town family member there. So my uncle, who's her, my, her, her son picked me up from the airport and he was with her when she died And I remember him telling me about the experience and that it took a really long time for the coroner to come and get her body. And I had this like visceral reaction. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Like how awful and like gross. Like, I don't know exactly all of the descriptors that I said. And he was like, and he, he spent decades living in Africa and he's like, why? And I'm like, oh, it's like, it was really beautiful sitting there with her. Um, after it was, she was, it was very peaceful passing and then just like sitting there with, with her body. And I hadn't really never thought about it that way for sure. Because to me, it's like, well, they're dead. Get out of there. Yeah. Everybody needs to get out of there. And, and, and that is so much the American experience. Like death is to be feared. And like you said, uh, in a lot of cases, it's ultimately about a celebration of their life and how they lived. Mm -hmm. And it's just really interesting to me, especially in Christian circles or or faith-based circles, how, you know, eternity, the idea of eternity or or heaven has been something that you kind of hold on for and you get through this life to get there. But like, that's not really consistent with the text. Yeah, It's kind of uh, something that, that the idea has morphed into and, one of the examples that I used on Sunday is is like telephone, the game telephone. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, we do that every once in a while in a leadership meeting. And like you get three or four people uh, removed from the source and like you can have a whole new sentence or a whole new thought. Oh, for sure. And it's like w- when a lot of this was being written, it was thousands of, of years ago. And basically this idea of heaven has become something entirely different than what sacred scripture tends to to say it is. Yeah. So what is it? Uh, well, I mean the idea is that heaven heaven is in this present moment. You know, that that it's not a place to go that it, that it's here, it, it's right now, it's in front of us and there's no reason to believe um that you can live an unintentional or kind of like um a scarcity life now and think that you're going to quote unquote inherit heaven later Mm -hmm. that 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 the real biblical narrative has a lot more to do with like being reconnected to 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 the god that was lost in the garden of eden and like now all of a sudden you're back in and and like you are an ambassador you know moment by moment bringing heaven to earth yeah and it hit me right and i i did not have it uh in my notes uh, but it hit me in the moment and I shared uh, with the congregation just like it's really amazing that that no matter where you are right now listening to this um, and no matter what time of day it is, you have an opportunity before this day is over to literally bring heaven to someone else's life. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the worse off that person is, the easier it is for you to just like change their world. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. I like that thought so much. Um, I feel, I think when I was growing up, now that I'm processing through it, I think I felt a little bit of shame around shocker, very prone to shame. Um, but like heaven, the thought of heaven freaked me out. The thought of et- eternity. Sure. It's like, uh, so I'm going to be there forever. Sure. Like, you know, and your mind can't really wrap around forever. Yeah. My mind can't at least. And so, um, it didn't actually bring me a whole lot of comfort for sure. like the idea of heaven. And I mean, I'm still obviously working through some things, but I like the thought of like heaven being here now and like just the level of like beauty and purpose that that brings much like the quote that you shared that, um, what we do today echo, echoes echo. throughout. Yeah. I mean, what an opportunity. Sure. Um, like that's something I can wrap my head around. Well, it, it appears as if a, a better biblical theology, uh, you know, w- when Jesus used the words, first of all, people get confused because 
Jesus was still a Jew, and he did not want to use uh, God uh, because they they just would not say, they wouldn't spell or often say the full name of God Mm -hmm. because out of reverence. And so often when talking about the kingdom of God, uh, and and what it was like to be in an environment where God was in control and like God's plan was coming through in that moment, they would substitute and use the word heaven. And so we have a we have come up with a lot of ideas for what heaven looks like or what heaven is because Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven when he was really just trying to say like here's what an environment that God has been invited into looks like. Mm-hmm. And so we've come up with this huge narrative as to what heaven is going to be like. And again, uh, it's just really important that people dive into study for themselves. But like the age to come uh, is is something that Jesus would say in this age or the age to come. And and it really just comes back to, you know, if, if we do not learn how to live into this present moment, which takes a lot of hard work and a lot of self work of addressing past trauma and uh, figuring out what attachments or things are in our life, basically as um, um, pacifying us, you know, to try to get to that next place. Uh, We're never going to experience heaven here on earth. You know, one of the things that you've heard me say a lot is like, there should be no difference between a Saturday and a Monday in your life if you're doing it right. I can remember when I was a kid, you know, holidays were such a big deal. Uh, and, and and I think, honestly, if you grew up in the 70s, 80s, or early 90s, because we did not have access to information the way we do now, it was a lot easier to look forward to a day because there was so much more mystery in it. Uh, I, I've said before, and I haven't written about it, but I want to, like, revivals are dead. The secret sauce is dead. Uh I think in a lot of ways, Christmas and holidays are dead because there used to be, you could, you could, without the internet there and social media there, like tent revivals as an example, there could be so much more mystery wrapped up into this stranger that was coming into town. And therefore that curiosity, which is another word for faith, created an environment where um, what we would call the supernatural happened because people were open and expecting and they were hearing good things type of thing. And so now because all of that has changed, it, it, it's harder to live that way. Like it, it's harder to uh, get amped up for Christmas because in a lot of cases you've seen everything, how it functions and almost interacted with it through your phone um, ver- versus seeing it on that day. And so, you know, when I say that, you know, if you're living your life right, uh, there's no difference between a Saturday in a Monday, it's because you've confronted these these attachments and you're not looking forward to the next birthday party. You're not looking forward to the next holiday. You're not looking forward to that next thing. Like you are in the present moment. Uh, because if you don't, uh, I think my experience in talking with a lot of people is you wake up one day and the majority of your life is gone because you always lived for that next thing. You always lived for tomorrow but tomorrow is just another today. Uh, the potential in tomorrow is just a series of how you handled today. There, and, 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 and so that's the micro argument, right, to put it in our vernacular for what basically I think the biblical narrative says about heaven. If you continue to live for that next moment or for that Friday night party or get together, you, what you're going to end up doing is missing out on the real party, which is life that is right in front of you. And that Friday, you can enjoy and celebrate that, that Friday night gathering, but that, that will be better because you have lived into your present moments. Mm -hmm. And so the biblical narrative is don't expect that you're just going to arrive and inherit heaven one day when you never learn to live into the one moment that you have, which is right now. So what are, what do you think are some practical ways to, I mean, I think living in the moment is like a thing that it's like a sign people put in their bathroom or whatever. Yeah. Um, but what does it actually look like or how, how do you practice that? Yeah. It, it, it's really interesting because I'm reading a lot of different things right now. And 
one of the things that I'm I'm reading is uh, Richard Rohr's latest book, The Universal Christ, mm-hmm. and he takes Colossians one, and, and basically says that if we believe sacred scripture, that this energy that was there before all of the world was formed created everything, it's still holding everything together. Then God can be found in everything. Uh, that this this supernatural life is in everything. It's in every moment, and it's our opportunity to come alive to that understanding and be led by an inner consciousness that allows us to find heaven in every moment, even when it's hard, and almost as if uh, every hard and difficult moment that is full of void or full of lack is really just an opportunity in disguise to find where the Christos or this this God energy is. Uh, I have a friend um, who, who's a master psalm, mm-hmm. um, and w- one of the things that he likes to say is, uh, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Which obviously for a master psalm, that makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. That That's his vernacular. And, and I think that's, that's what we have the opportunity to look for in every moment. Uh, and that is like especially when we're being squeezed and life is hard. Where Where is the juice at? What can I get out of this? How can this serve me? And I think we're just now, social science is just now allowing us to, to start understanding trauma more. Uh, there are people out there like, uh, Kip, I think it's Kip is his first name, Mastin, who's talking about like, uh, it's probably safe to say, that mental illness, which is what we've called it in this country, really is a lot of unprocessed trauma. And, and I mention trauma because it tends to be unprocessed trauma that makes us fearful, that makes us grab an attachment or, or some sort of pacifier that keeps us from being in the moment because we're so fearful uh, of what's coming that, that might not be good. And so when you ask about practical examples of, of like, how do you live into the moment? It, it's really, as uh, Nelson Mandela said, for me, uh, figuring out that life life is not happening to me, right? Because I was made with this this energy, mm-hmm. and so is the environment around me. So it's happening happening for me. Life is not happening just to me. It's happening for me, and therefore it's my opportunity to, like, wake up and to say, like, how is this moment going to serve me? How can I find the beauty in this moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes it's not even, I mean, that's a very beautiful and deep answer, but I think sometimes it's just like being um, alive to like your senses. Like this morning I was driving in and um, I I realized like, gosh, this steering wheel on this car that I haven't paid for this month is like super smooth. Like the leather on it, it feels so good on my hands. Like sure. it's just, it's a, it's a relatively new car. And so the steering wheel is so smooth. And I'm like, what a great feel on my hands. Like this yeah. feels really nice in my hands. I like this steering wheel. What a great steering wheel. And it's something that obviously usually when I'm in the car and I'm driving places, I'm rushing and I'm doing 10 million more things at a time than I should be when I'm behind the wheel. But I think it's being, I think there's something about like, it can be as simple as that. Just like sure. being um, aware of like what you're feeling and smelling and seeing. And um, even if to your point, like it's, quote unquote, difficult or negative or whatever. Like I'm feeling anxious right now. Wow. My body is trying to protect me for something. How sure. great that I have a body that like, and a mind that knows to step in and senses that I'm feeling scared and wants to protect me from something. Um, and so I think sometimes it can be as simple as that. No, or, I, or I was walking I, through I my agree. neighborhood the other day and I noticed like all of these beautiful trees that I'm surrounded by. And I got to thinking like, did these come from? Like, did somebody plant them? Were they just here? And like having all of these deep thoughts about where these trees that are hundreds and hundreds of years old originated from. Yeah. And it's just like pausing for a second to have that level of awareness. I think sometimes it's like, I, I, I don't know how to sink deeper into a moment than that. Sure. Two questions. Uh, one, do you think we've been conditioned not to feel our feelings? Yes. Are you kidding? And two, where does that come from? 
That conditioning? Yeah. Where do you think that comes from? Um, this is something that you're pretty good about. You know, that, that I have found you to be really good with is like, um, and I think we mentioned it last week that like your feelings are your feelings and they're not good or bad. They're your feelings. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it depends on a lot of things. I think it can be a protection mechanism of like, if I don't feel this, then I don't have to like bear the weight of it. If I can just kind of sweep it under the rug and pretend that it's not happening. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes, especially, well, I think we've talked about this a little bit, just like being quote unquote strong yeah. and having it all together and um, not coming off as being weak or dramatic. Typically that's dependent on how, how you identify your gender. Right. Weak for men and dramatic for women. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something that we are conditioned to do in order to look like we have, have it all together. And I think, I mean, even when I look at my kids and like, they have these crazy tantrums, if I'm in my right mind, I can say like, what a moment to be in. Like I can sink into this moment and be grateful that my kids are, um, emotionally and mentally like aware enough to know, like I feel upset and I feel safe enough to express it. Yeah. How great. It's annoying as hell, but how great. Sure. I was, I was taking Chase and Kate to school this morning and often like both of them, all of my kids have been like me and that I was really nervous going to school as a kid. I feel like I saw more things and I was more aware of energy. So I was really nervous. And so sometimes when I feel that they are nervous, we'll listen to reggae sure. uh, on the way in mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. And so we were listening to Bob Marley and Three Little Birds. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I just learned uh, a, a therapy or a, a, a resource, a tool uh, in, a, in a group like therapy um, session that I was a part of treating feelings as little birds. Mm -hmm. And I know we briefly mentioned this, mm -hmm. but just like letting them land and not shooing them off as a nuisance, but like letting them talk to you and like figuring out why they're there and what they're trying to tell you versus just like, you're, you're an annoyance. Get, get out of here mm -hmm. type of thing. And, and I think what we're starting to learn more and more about disease, right? We've made the word dis-ease into a whole new thing, which is a whole nother podcast, but like dis-ease, it, it comes from, uh, you know, when you start to have autoimmune and, and other uh, issues, illnesses or ailments, uh, it's because all of those feelings that were just, they were coming at you for one reason or another, you could acknowledge them and be okay with them and let them go. But when we stuff them because we can't, we can't take them or we're afraid of them or we've been conditioned to be afraid of them, they lodge in us. Um, you, you know, there, there have been so many um, books about our body, like speaking, like your body speaks your mind, all, all of these different things. We're basically like we, and this is what we do at Body Garage State, and we get these feelings that have turned in uh, to some sort of like uh, ailment or, or a lack of uh, range of motion or something that is sore or something that doesn't function anymore and we get it out. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. You you can acknowledge these things and, and, and let them go. And I think people underestimate how much these stored up, pinned up feelings undermine their potential. Oh, for sure. Well, and it, I mean, it keeps you from experiencing as you like experiencing heaven on earth. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned Bob Marley and, so I went on this whole, in my mind, this whole thing about, you know, so when people smoke pot, yeah. <laughs> um, there is something to be said about how generally speaking, like this is a pretty big statement, but generally speaking, like I think that people smoke pot do a really good job of living in the moment. Like sure. they're noticing a For lot sure. of things. Have you ever seen that double rainbow video? Yeah. I think that guy was on pot. I don't know what he was on, but yeah. do, do, are you on pot? Uh, that's, I mean, you're high. Okay. Go on. Um, but I think what, 
they're doing is they're slowing down. Sure. Like it slows you sure. down, right? Sure. And so they're kind of, I mean, they're just like taking it all in and noticing like the beauty. I mean, in this YouTube video, it was like the beauty of the double rainbow was yeah. blowing his mind. Um, and so I think that's a lot of it too with our culture is like, it's go, go, go. Do not waste a minute of your time feeling that feeling because we have things to do. For sure. Um, and so I think there's something to be said for um, just the, the importance of slowing down yeah. and letting yourself like, oh, I'm feeling this right now. You know, a lot of times I'll feel like my face gets hot or I'm, and I'm, it's like, I, I, I have to stop and catch up and be like, oh, I'm really angry right now. Right. What's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, but I think that's another way that you can like live in the exact moment that you're in. For sure. Is to just slow it, take your foot well, off the gas a little bit. I, I mean, one of the things that, you know, as I have jumped into investigating a number of these things uh, with the church and like, what was, what, what, what is Ad Fontes? Like, what did Jesus church look like? The movement that he started, what did it look like? And then with the rise of Rome, like, I, I, I can't say it enough and people need to go on their own journey. We so underestimate like bureaucracy and control. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ever go to Washington DC and hang out around politicians, it is a world in itself. Like you are on another planet no and it, it, it's all about designing things to keep the people that are in power in power. And people are like, Oh, that's a conspiracy theory message or, Oh, that's a liberal message or, Oh, it's a Republican message. It's just the truth that the people that are in power design systems to keep them in that position of power. And I say that to say, if you're listening to this, you would be shocked and you need to go on your own journey. L let me give you an example. You mentioned pot, like cannabis is cannabis. God made it. Uh, yes, it can be harvested and compounded and made into be something that's thousands of times stronger than what it naturally is by itself. But if it's here, like it's here for a reason. God made it. Uh, we, we know the health benefits of it when it's used the right way to calm a mind down, to help people sleep, all of these different things. We underestimate like the war on drugs or the D.A.R.E. program and how things like that have been created to control people. And, and, and like everybody's like, oh, no, Nancy Reagan would never do that. <laughs> you just don't know who was Nancy Reagan was being controlled by and the systems that are set up and people are like, you know, whether it's the border or, or any anything else, like psychedelics is, is a huge uh, topic that has come up over the last five years and it's going to do nothing but get even more important because like now we're realizing that in with the right dose in the appropriate context, uh, different psychedelics out there like psilocybin uh, are very, very good for curing anxiety and all kinds of things. And they were doing this thousands of years ago before government got involved and said, oh, yeah, you can't do that anymore. We are going to raise up a whole industry that's profit driven and we're going to have uh, pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical drugs. And, 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 and it's funny, the average person listening to this will be like, oh, well, but that's regulated and it's controlled by, you know, the FDA and these people. And it's like, no, you, you just underestimate when mankind gets involved what the power struggle will, will really create. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. For sure. Uh, there is, uh, you know there's an extreme amount of evidence that uh, people for thousands of years were using plant-based medicine as their only medicine. Uh, I, I was talking with a group of doctors the other day as we we're working on this uh, project where we're trying to create um, the, the WebMD, but for natural medicine. And j just talking about that very thing, like how plant-based medicine has been around forever and it always used to be pr prior to the 1950s it, it used to be how do we keep people functioning 
at an optimal level. Mm -hmm. Now our quote unquote healthcare system, and and obviously there's a need for certain things. I'm, I'm not throwing the whole thing out, but like, it's all about treating you once you are sick. It's like fixing things that are sick. And it, it, it never used to be that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there's last time I looked in the average cancer patient, there's a million dollars worth of revenue. So, so when someone has, or could have something no different than COVID, uh, you were going to get diagnosed. If it could be close, you were going to get diagnosed with COVID. There was $15,000, uh, in treating a patient. There was an extra 30 if it was a positive diagnosis for sure. for, for hospital or no, excuse me. It was fifteen to twenty thousand if you were diagnosed with COVID. It was an extra thirty thousand if you were put on a ventilator, from from what the government was compensating these hospitals for with insurance money. Uh, Pfizer just came out and and showed where uh, the, their vaccine generated three billion dollars in revenue. Uh, all I'm saying is follow the money. Mm-hmm. You, you always if if you hear something about some poll that was taken or some truth that is coming out. That's what polls are about. Research. Again, it just drives me okay. crazy. All right, let me just bring us back a little bit. I here. will, but hold on. One, oh, l- okay. l- I got to say this. More important than the research and the truth that comes out, in the, the quote-unquote truth that comes out in the research, follow the money first. Figure out who paid for that research, and it will tell you a lot. Sure. All right, bring us back. Well, and I think even more than that, I mean, people can follow the money and research and blah, 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 blah. But I think it comes back to like, and that stuff isn't going anywhere. I mean, all of the power hungry people and the money, dirty money, blah, blah, blah. I don't really think that that's going anywhere necessarily, but you can take control of your own life and bring heaven to earth where you are. And so I think spend all the time you want researching and putting up Instagram posts and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like your responsibility, I believe is to bring heaven to where you are and let other people do what they're going to do. Obviously we still have to live within the systems created to some degree. And so we have the responsibility to be a part of our, our larger community, but I think it can bring a whole lot of peace of mind to people when it's like, okay, well I can control what I can control. And that is who I am to the people in the world around me. For sure. I I mean, one of the things that I said on Sunday is that, isn't it interesting that the people that talk the most about going to heaven tend to be the people that are least engaged with bringing heaven to earth now. Yeah. And and, and that's just the idea. Like if you're giving up your whole life to look forward to heaven, like you've missed out. For sure. No different than the person that wakes up on Monday and says, I can't wait to that party on Friday. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, Because after that party's over two hours later, you're going to realize that you just gave up four to five days of your week, four to five days of your life. What are, that's why I always liked Christmas Eve better than Christmas. For sure. Christmas is kind of a letdown. You still had one more thing. For sure. That's why a lot of people look forward to that. Yeah. Um, What are some ways that you, so you talked about, being living in the moment, how, how do you identify what, how do you know that you're not living in the moment? Or how do you, how do you know when you, how do you kind of catch yourself? Well, they say that, uh, worry is an, indi- or, or being anxious is an indication that you're not living in the moment. So is that true for you? I think so. I, th- I think, I mean, and it's a huge temptation to me, uh, that I have to fight on a regular basis, um, that, the more responsibility you have, the more you have to worry about. But often the answer for tomorrow is in this present moment. Mm-hmm. And and even if the answer for tomorrow is in two to three present moments away from this one, each of those are built on top of this present moment. Uh, and so I think you can uh, be worrying uh, and that and or anxious, and that's a sign that you're living into tomorrow. Uh, I think another way that you know that uh, you're not in this present moment, like guilt and shame, is living in the past, uh, still being weighed down by a bad decision that you made, which, you know, bad decisions tend to be just qualifiers that equip you if you let them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, I think living into this present moment is, you know, noticing the features on a on a person's face and you can't do it for everyone because often there are multiple people 
in your present moment, but like no different than you said with on your walk, like looking at the trees Mm -hmm. and like noticing something specific about them, like picking up those details, taking a deep breath, like realizing that you're here, you know. Do you ever drive somewhere and you get there and you're like, I don't remember driving here. Oh, for sure. I think that's kind of it. It's like you can go through your whole day. So many people are so checked out and I do it too, but um, so many people are so checked out just going through from one thing to the next to the next. And it's like, how did I get here? Now all of a sudden I'm 50 years old and I have no idea what just happened for the last 30 years. I, um, I don't know that I still have it on my phone, but I, oh, I do actually. I put on Instagram uh, a quote yesterday from Oscar Wilde. Most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions. Their lives. <laughs> oh, I think of mimicry. Mimicry. Their lives. A mimicry. We'll figure out what that word means, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, their passions, a quotation. Like they're living. Mimicking. Probably mimicking. Yeah. they're. I mean, they're literally living their life based on what someone else has told them or what they think it should be versus like really living into it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And like somebody asked me the other day, what the hardest part about parenting is or the most surprising thing about parenting. I can't remember how they phrased it. And one of the things that I said was like letting my kid be who my kid is like letting her be who she is and not because there's a lot of things, especially right now about um, both my girls, but Evie, especially because she's older that I'm like, but, but don't you like that? Like, why don't you like that? That doesn't make any sense to me that you don't like that. And she's just her own, she's her own person. And it's, it's the work is to let her like, not like a thing that I think she should like, or that I don't yeah. understand why she doesn't like it. Um, because I think so often we shape one another, not even just our own children into like, no, oh, you like this, like, this yeah. is how you, this. And so that's why so many of us dress the same and like the same things and do the same. And it's like, Gosh, we lose so much when we, when we mimicry. When we mimicry. <laughs> what do you think the difference is between living a full life and a life that's too busy or stretched too thin? Gratitude. Okay. Is that the wrong answer? I don't know. I don't know. It's the first thing that came to me. I think, I think a full life um, breeds an abundance of gratitude. Because you're doing things like, oh my gosh, look at the trees. Like they're not just, it's not just a setting that you're placed in. They're like real live things that you can touch and see and breathe in. Um, and, and I think that that creates, that births a level of gratitude that when you're just flying around and not noticing anything, or even, I don't mean to make it all positive, like even um, grief, and like feeling the weight of loss because something was so rich and so good. Um, I think that can even create a level of gratitude that you don't get when you just fly through life. Yeah. I I think it's really interesting that we have like refused to be okay with like the lower vibing feelings in life that, that we've somehow, especially in, in religious environments, um, created this idea that, that you can't feel low or if you do feel low, you can't be good. Like life can't be good when you're feeling low. Mm -hmm. What do you think that comes from? People don't know how to be with people who feel low. I think it makes people uncomfortable because we're a fix it culture. What if you can't fix it? So rather than sitting with the fact that you can't fix it, you just don't sit with it at all. Yeah. Is that what you think? I think I think being a fix it culture is right, and we've unintentionally associated um, value with um, being able to to fix other people's problems. I, I think we underestimate. You know, we want to change someone's life and make them better. You know, Anthony DeMello says that every act is an act of self interest, and very few people can see that and understand it. Mm-hmm. Uh, very few people. Un- do not understand that the only reason they're trying to help someone else is to feel better about themselves. Sure. You know, and someone will say, well, that's not true. Like I, I try to help someone without, uh, just because, because I want somebody to do that for me. Well, listen to what you just said. Like 
your belief system tells you that life is better for you when you help others. And therefore you're trying to make life better for you. And so you're helping others and there's nothing wrong with that, but you just need to acknowledge that like every act, every behavior of ours is is in our own self-interest. And it's, it starts with knowing that. Well, if you're bringing heaven to earth for someone like you get to be a part of that too. Yeah. You get to experience some of that too. Let's have a game to close the podcast. Oh, let's play a game. I don't like games, but okay. Let's come on. Are you a game family? Like no. board games? No. Yeah, us either. No. Couldn't do it. We were very competitive. Would have started fights. Oh, sure. Let's come up with, off the top of our head, 10 ways. You're going to do five. I'm going to do five. We're going to go back and forth till we get to 10. No. Oh, can we use Google? Sure. 10 creative ways that someone can bring heaven to earth today. Do you want to go or do you want me to go? Creative? What do you mean by creative? Well, it doesn't have to be creative. Just okay. 10 ideas. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start. Go. Eye contact. Oh, so practical. Oh, man. I think it makes such a big difference when you actually allow a person to be seen. All right. Number one, eye contact. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, buy the person's coffee behind you when you pay for yours next time. Or tea if you're on a cleanse. Yeah, that's so stressful, though, for the person receiving it because then they feel like they have to keep going. Well, you don't have to tell them until you do it already. (sighs) Okay, that's fine. Number three. Um, Number, well, (laughs) it should not be so hard. (laughs) Uh, I, I mean, I think it will resonate with people. How do you bring heaven to earth, like, practically speaking? Number three. Um... Sometimes I bring my neighbor's garbage cans up for them. Oh, wow. The audience love that one. By sometimes, I mean I did it one time. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty here at Emotion well, Chips, the podcast. I remembered that my husband listens. Oh. Oh, he would correct you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So number three, bring your neighbor's trash can. That's a really good one. Thanks. Uh, number four, I would say, um, next time you're meeting with someone before the meeting gets started or before the casual, or maybe right after the, the icebreaker is there and you're just making small talk, ask them this phrase, what are you bringing to this moment? Hmm. And just give them an opportunity to express their feelings. And they'll say, what do you mean? What am I bringing to this moment? Like my car keys? What do you mean? And just say, no, like, emotionally, where are you at? What are you bringing to this moment? Mm, how feminine energy of you. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, Was that number four? I don't know. This is going to take forever. All right, go. Number five. Um, how do you bring heaven to earth? Uh, um, think of somebody, like, reach out to somebody not to ask for something. Maybe just to yeah. see how they are. Check, Check in. in. Yeah. I think it's, it feels so good when someone randomly texts me and is just like, hey, I'm thinking about you. And I think we have those moments all the time and we think they're random. But since we know that everything happens for a reason. The real reason everything happens for a reason. Uh, yeah. Next time you think of somebody, just drop them a text. Yep. Or, or call them. Ooh, that's next level. I'm that not there is, yet. That, yeah. That, well, yeah. Text is definitely. That's real heaven. Efficient. Uh, we're going to say number... Six. Six. We could be at five, but we'll say... No, we're at six. Number six. Uh, Number six, a way you can bring heaven to earth is make yourself a couple of care packages to put in the back of your car. And when someone is standing, begging and asking for money, either give them money or give them money in one of your little care packages, like some uh, Clorox wipes in there or like hand wipes in there, Mm -hmm. some water. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like be prepared, be ready to meet... People's needs. How sweet. Number seven. Um, I go through an entire meal or meeting or evening um, without your phone. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. You, you are bringing heaven to earth. That was a really good one. Uh, number eight. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. Uh, number eight. Look for opportunities to say yes. No matter what. Uh, last night I was laying on the couch and Kate, uh, said, 
can we go to Dairy Shed? And for whatever reason. That's uh, an ice cream place. Yeah, it's an ice cream place. Uh, I think she and her mom had already been out. I think her mom actually had just picked her up from dance close to Dairy Shed. And they did not go. And so she said, her mom said no. She said, Dad, will you take me? And I said, yes. Just because not it wasn't convenient. But I just like, give a radical yes. Sure. You wanted to be the favorite. Uh, we know. I mean, I don't you know. You know, a little self-serving. But uh, we, we ended up not going. Oh, what a terrible story. No, it's good because here's what happened. We ended up going outside and she wanted to play basketball instead. Huh. And so instead of going to get ice cream, it led to an even more sweet, pun healthy. intended, healthy moment. And, and we played basketball together. And she almost beat me in pig. Or horse, sorry, I lied, horse. Oh, it's a longer game than pig. Definitely. Number nine. Number nine. Um... Share the Emotionships podcast with somebody that you love. Wow. That is definitely bringing heaven to earth. Do I have to do a real one? If you want to. <sighs> um, tip extra. Oh, I like it. Uh, next time you're out, tip. Tip it, period or tip extra. An excessive what you amount. Do. I love that. Number 10, rounding up our top 10 good. list of how you can bring heaven to earth. Uh, last night I was texting with a friend uh, slash employee of mine uh, who has been with me for um, almost 15 years now. And so I had the thought, similar to, to what we were talking about earlier, uh, to express gratitude. And I picked out just one little thing that uh, he has done. And I texted him and said, hey, this might seem super random, but I just want to let you know that I've noticed this over the years. And I'm really, really grateful uh, for you and for how you have demonstrated this characteristic or quality. Yes. And so I would just say one of the ways that you bring heaven to earth is by celebrating uh, the ways that you have seen other people bring heaven to earth. And that's, uh, we say that where you put your focus, you put your energy and where you put your energy, it grows. Mm -hmm. And so I think not only do we have an opportunity to bring heaven to earth ourselves, but we can, we can cheerlead the heck out of those that we see bringing heaven to earth and in doing so, uh, see more of it. For sure. The rest of your employees are not waiting for a text message or anything now. Yeah. Just, Precedence, setting mm -hmm. precedence, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Yep. New ways to, to bring heaven here to earth. That's so good. Good job, us. Good job. Until next time. Yes.